and it's quite astonishing when you when you think of modern day armies only um, your highly specialized highly trained units deploy in groups of small groups of four and eight but um, for the Rhodesian national servicemen um, this was the way it happened uh, these chaps were out of school they were put through a, um, a pretty rigorous uh, infantry training course uh, admittedly but um, at the end of that they were out uh, with a map and a compass a lot of them and um, they were in the real world of a shooting war and um, these are the youngsters that ended up under your command um, and you were obviously the right guy for the job because you came with so much combat experience and uh, you could lead these guys in the right direction but um, Still, it's a, I think it's a testament to the caliber of the young Rhodesians that they were able to rise to the occasion as well as they did. Um, one in the company was posted with me and as OC from uh, Big Falls in the north of the country, right down to the south of the country to Bite Ridge. And uh, it was an extremely hot area, uh, terrorist wise, um, of both Zipra and Zanla coming into the country and focusing the uh, ambushes and so on on the two roads, the one going up to Fort Vic and into Salisbury and the other one going up to Bulawayo. And in that B, in that triangle that uh, was between the two roads, we had a tremendous concentration of guerrillas uh, giving us lots and lots of hassle. They're ambushing the convoys daily. And anyway, he, he came to me and he said, sir, the, the guys are ready for you. And I went out there and I revved them and I said, look, all you guys have been doing is turning bloody government rations into crap right now. You haven't just achieved anything. You haven't killed anybody. You've had some fleeting contacts, but no connections. So go out there and for God's sake, do something about it. So he went out there and a couple of hours later, uh, I was called to the ops room and they were having a contact. And our Bolson had picked up tracks with these guys. It was a little six man patrol. And, and they had followed these guys and they were, it was quite a considerable group. There were 60 of them. And our Bolson taking my rev to heart had got his guys in extended line and ordered a charge and they charged the 60. <laughs> and it's originally, initially backed off and Boston was engaging and then when they realized that there weren't a lot of guys there, they started really giving them a uh, squirt back, you know. And that's when we got airborne, we got over the position. And what we didn't know is the 60 went back to another group, a bigger group, and in, in fact joined up forces and there were like 200 of them against six guys. And we were overhead, uh, the target area in the 206. Jackson was firing MAG out the door. We were getting like this hail of fire coming up from the ground upwards and green tracers flying at us, hitting the aircraft and so on. Jackson got hit and suddenly I had this little white face back of me saying, I'm hit, I'm hit. And I said, well, where? And he kept feeling around his backside or whatever, but there was no hit, he wasn't hit, you know. He was, it felt a punch in the backside from the rounds hitting the sandbags, but he fortunately wasn't wounded or anything. So we carried on revving the, the contact uh, on the ground with Bolson and then uh, heavily engaged. And I was bringing in a call sign from the north. It was, was running down to give them assistance. When I suddenly heard uh, a really, very familiar voice on the, on the air, and it was a chopper pilot who'd worked with us in the earlier months with fire force and so on. It was Ulo Grinica from the South African Air Force. And he had been sitting on the airstrip across the border at Messina and board still playing with his radio, listening to stuff gone to 118.7 and heard this punch up going on. And he said to his tech, well, I don't know what you think, but uh, I'm going across there to help my guys. They're in a hell of a position. They're in a hell of a job there. So he came across and he went back to one in the company, got hold of the CSM, got the CSM to deploy troops up the road, uh, a land tail with extra troops. And he was then ferrying in the troops to me all off his own bat, off his own accord. And I didn't know anything about it. And I first heard his voice and he said, uh, hello, Sunray, this is Ula. How can I help you? Where can I put the first stop? So basically, Alan's in the South African Air Force. He's got no right, he's got no authority to cross the border and come into None Indonesia. Adult. So without any no. permission at all, he just gets into his helicopter and flicks up to find you and help you. Correct. Anyway, <clears throat> he had ferried in a couple of stops for us uh, to assist and help Alan Bolson. He picked up one of my guys on the indication of local Pete the Barris, who was going back to show them where they had a captured and they tied him to a tree 
that they could carry on in the paint shop. Uh, they picked up, the, uh, well, they were going to pick up the capsule when uh, we, the big group of on the ground joined forces and now we were being engaged by 200 on the ground. Uh, and it was like hail coming up. And, and the aircraft that I was in was hit like 130 times. Um, this is a 206. Never, the 206, yeah. <laughs> never heard old uh, Ulla again, again, but I couldn't get sort of involved because we were too sort of involved in what we were doing. And, and uh, old uh, Holly Knight was doing a fighter pilot stuff, ducking and diving where he could. Um, and he said to me, look, um, I think we need to get as high as we can because I've got no oil pressure. Uh, and because we're going to lose this now, we're going to lose the engine. And I said, oh my goodness. So we climbed up high, spiraled around and went up high. And then suddenly the engine cut and we had no power. And it was very quiet, and very silent. And I said, cheers to the guys on the ground. And we started heading back. It was sort of last light. And we managed to do a dead prop landing on the Bightbridge airfield, having alerted them. And they had vehicles out with their lights shining up on the runway because we had no lights on the runway. And we did a dead prop landing on the runway. We just hit it right at the very end. Um, so we were very lucky. And when I got out the aircraft, legs were shaking and so on. And this TF captain came up to me. The two RR were based on the airport at the airfield. Uh, Colonel French was in charge of them. We were doing an HDF there, or about to start a big HDF where they were going to be under command me. And he said, uh, Major, you're in big trouble. You ordered a guy from South Africa across here. And, you know, you don't know, but he was shot down and he managed to auto-rotate at the end of the other uh, end of the runway. And his technician was shot five times and your guy, the Barros, was shot twice. And uh, there's big cuck in the land. You're going to be court-martialed along with Ulla Grinica and the colonel wants to see you ASAP. So I went there and I was really, really cross. And I gave old Cedric French a rev uh, because I knew him from Civvy Street and he was part of the Farmers Co-op, whatever. And I said, instead of crapping on us, we've just been to a hell of a big punch up here. And if, we, if it wasn't for Ulla Grinica, we'd have definitely lost guys on the ground. So instead of doing, uh, you know, reporting back that you're going to have us court martialed or whatever, I said, we should be doing the opposite of that. And uh, we then, he saw the light and, and we changed our plan and we put in letters. And I'm happy to report that uh, Air Marshal uh, Rogers, who's in charge of the South African Air Force, um, accepted the whole thing in the spirit in which Ulla Grinica meant it to be. And Ulla Grinica got a honest crooks for his actions. But the aircraft had to be ferried across the, the, the bike bridge, uh, bridge at night, covered with camo nets and so on, because it was totally stuffed. He had taken like 65 hits, and uh, nobody even knew that Chopper was in with us. So that was the kind of thing that we would do. Well, there was, um, it's interesting, Bob, that was Bob Rogers, it was General Bob Rogers who was the commander of the South African Air Force said, and he was a great, uh, he had a very soft spot for Rhodesia because his brother, Buck Rogers, was the, um, was the self-appointed mayor of Enkeldorn. Um, he, he owned the service station uh, and he used to run in most of his business from the, the pub at the Enkeldorn Hotel. That was Bob's yeah, right. brother, Buck. But they were both Spitfire pilots during the Second World War. And what's quite funny about old Buck is um, after Ian Smith declared UDI, old, old Buck said to hell with it. Well, if they're going to declare independence from Britain, I think Enkeldorn should become independent from Rhodesia. We want to be I remember own. that, yeah. And so he declared the Republic of Enkeldorn and started issuing passports. So if you actually wanted to go and have a beer in the Enkeldorn pub, the citizen yeah. of the Republic of Enkeldorn. Otherwise, they actually had a jail cell there. And they That's threw right. him inside for being um, an illegal immigrant. But that yeah. was that was on Bob Rowe. Brother Buck. And so I'm sure when he heard the story, all credit to him, he could he could um, he found a way through it and, and did the honorable yeah. thing. Thank heavens. Yeah, that was very really good. Uh, I want to just say that Ulla Grinica went on in Angola to get a second uh, on a script. Really? Uh, we were shot, badly shot in the leg. Amazing guy. I remember you telling me that uh, you were involved with the whole Kazangula ferry uh, story. What happened was, um, we, this was before we came down to Whitebridge, we were at uh, Big Falls and the Flight of Angels, which was that Ruach flight that flew over the falls every day with, with 
uh, tourists was fired on from the Zipra on the other side of the river, on the Zambian side of the river, with a SAM-7. It was an old, apparently an, some old stock, because the thing uh, went out of, uh, it took off okay from the Zambian side, but then it lost its, its uh, trace on the aircraft and it went into the Elephant Hills. And it okay. landed in the Elephant Hills and there was a number of uh, things that happened there. They, hearing the explosion, they turned off the power so the pumps wouldn't work and one thing or another. And also the water was gravity fed down and they were spraying the golf course at the time. End result, the Elephant Hills burned down very quickly. And we were right based next to it as one end of company in the old National Parks camp. We charged up there trying to uh, see what we could do, pulling guys out of the casino part, uh, pulling people out and so on. But at the end of that, uh, I received uh, instructions from General Walls at ComOps to say, uh, I want you to make it do an appreciation and tell me how you can take the pressure off the falls. This is a, a big tourist site for us. It's one of the only ones working at the moment. And we don't want, uh, we want the emphasis taken away from the falls. So very quickly uh, came up with a plan that we should attack the ferry at Kazangula, which was their lifeline really, because they weren't using the Big Falls Bridge. And we should do that uh, maybe um, by uh, engaging first the Zambian and uh, the Zambians were based on the other side of the Kazangula uh, point to, uh, across the river from us at uh, where the ferry, the ferry landed. And they were also based there together with the Zipra. So uh, the plan was accepted by General Walls and he sent me in uh, a section of SAS guys to help me under Scotty McCormack, they came in. They went in the night before, as I did with Ron van uh, uh, We were going to be snipers. We had 306, I had a 306 sporting rifle, and Ronnie had a 300 H&H. &H. And Ronnie van Heerden was uh, my mate from uh, National Parks, probably the best offhand shot I knew. So I got him in, I called him up quickly, and he came up. He was at Robin's camp. And we went in, uh, we set up as uh, snipers in the reed bed opposite uh, the Botswana BDF post and opposite across the river from uh, the Kazangula ferry site and where the Zipra were. And early in the morning when they came out to bathe and wash through their, uh, you know, brush their teeth and all the rest of it, um, we engaged them. And, I, and between Ronnie and I, we accounted for seven. We, uh, one of us shot four and the other shot three. And at that moment, Scotty McCormack came down in the 2.5 the one in F25 with a captured B10 recoilless uh, gun on it. And we engaged the ferry, which was halfway across the river. He had a direct strike with a second shot on the tower and the ferry sank very dramatically in the middle of the, of the river. Um, quite interesting that those shots, uh, the best shot I ever made in my life, a couple of shots, was 760 meters. And that was measured on the aerial photograph. And we practiced that at the range before we came, when we, before we deployed. So that's what happened there and how we took the steam off before. And half past five in the morning, we RV'd again back at the airstrip, took off. We were overhead uh, the uh, Metopus when I changed channels onto the frequency that we were operating on just to check in with the call signs. And I got November Tango Romeo from most of them. And suddenly as we were flying in, it was in October. So it was very dry and no leaves on the trees or any grass on the ground, whatever, or very little. And I suddenly saw this puff of white smoke and obviously white smoke was a contact. And I said, okay, call sign in contact, give me a quick brief. And this guy was quickly on the air telling me that they had engaged the group, been engaged by a group of, and we got over the position and we could see a group of 12 from the air and they were running and the, and the two of our guys were chasing them. So Simpson said to me, behind my seat on the floor of the aircraft is my FN. And he had a whole lot of boxes of ammo and some magazines and stuff. So. He said, grab them, uh, the FN, because we had no uh, other support, you know, and we couldn't do, we were trying to put these guys and keep their heads down so we could close with them. So I grabbed the FN, he opened his uh, window on the left-hand side of the plane where the pilot flies from, and I stood over him uh, and started shooting at these guys running. And it was terrible because I couldn't see the strikes or anything. But the next thing, the aircraft went into all these maneuvers and dive, and Michael started screaming, I thought we were hit. But what had happened was the hot dorpies had hit the perspex of the aircraft and bounced back down his shorts and were burning him uh, on the inner side of his legs. <laughs> so anyway, uh, to cut the story short, but to get to the exciting part, uh, 
he said, why don't you reload the magazines with Tracer? Because we kept losing where these guys were and had to come around again. And then we would find that it was that break again. So I reloaded these magazines completely with Tracer ammo. And I came back in and I started shooting again, this time holding the rifle at an angle so that the bullets hit the, the aircraft floor as opposed to hitting the first specs. And um, quickly, well, after a short while, I uh, heard the guys on the ground shout, well done, you've, you've got one, you've got one. And then you've got another one. I, I managed to hit two guys from the aircraft. And the interesting part was when they eventually caught up to them and finished them off and so on. Uh, this was the Zipra Corsa that had just come into the country and they were carrying an HF radio that had never been recorded in the country before. We'd never, and through the whole war, ever recorded that the, the folks were carrying radios. So and this was an HF means, and this was a big group, obviously, just coming in, all rice fleck, uniform, and so on. It was highly important, and they were very excited when we got back and reported it from one of the company. And they sent old Ian Smith's private uh, aircraft, I think it was the Seneca, uh, to come and collect the radio. So something that could have ended up the other way around ended up you know, we got praise for so it was a good move and ended well. Hi, um, I just want to talk a little bit about some fire force actions and about uh, premonitions and sixth sense. You know, I think during uh, warfare, particularly uh, how it affected me, uh, I was um, I was prone to see things before they happened at times. And I'll give you an example of this: was one big fire force action that we did. I was based in the Bight Bridge area. Roy Makovic, the brigade commander from one brigade, got hold of me. Said he was sending down a fire force, fire force Delta, to come to us. And uh, one in-depth company would be the fire force Delta. I was to do KCAR, and uh, we had a day to do the training with our lads. And they all took to it like ducks to water, I must say. And uh, Tom Fulton was one of the guys. He was there, the int officer from brigade. He was there helping us do the training. And then the next day we deployed in support of Archie Moore, who was in the Salu Scouts, working in the Siorca TTL. And we were deployed to Mazunga Ranch, which is part of Liebig's Ranch, the Mazunga section. John and Mari Barkley, John was the manager there, and they were very hospitable to us and looked after all of us. Mari gave us all lunch, which was amazing. I parked off on the lawn, got a bit of a nap, and woke up and I'd had this premonition, a little dream if you like, and I wanted to just highlight how during a war and during times when uh, your senses are on edge and everything else, you mustn't laugh these things off, you should pay attention to them. Anyway, I, in the premonition or in the dream, I knew exactly where 20 eggs were, and I thought, well, I must get hold of Roy Makovich quickly and get released from this duty looking after or in standby for the scouts. I phoned Roy on the old crank the handle uh, party line and said to him, look Roy, we've got a senior, I've got 20 gigs. I know we're 20 gigs are at this time, but I want clearance please to take the fire force and get there before we run out of light. He said, well, how, this is amazing. How do you know this? And I said, well, I can't really tell you, you know, we, <laughs> we don't, we shouldn't talk about this on the means because it's, it's, um, it's not very open to everybody and and we better be careful so he said no 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 we'll go go and we'll talk afterwards i said okay got the siren going and called all the guys out and got all the um, pilots in for a quick briefing so it's going to be a very quick briefing i know we're 20 so at this time they're right there at, at, as i'm talking to you we've got to go now and one of the smart alex said to me well how do we know this you know are we not just going on a wild goose chase a lemon and i said no we're not uh, believe me i know I've got it from good authority and I know where these guys are and in any event uh, I'm the senior rank here and I'm pulling it if I can at this time and making a joke out of it. So Chaz Goatley was the KCAR pilot, uh, Beaver Shaw was my gunner and I told the guys K, um, the KCAR would lead in the fire force, low level we'd go uh, lead us right onto the target area and we weren't far away, we were about 20 minutes flying time away. So we embust and all the choppers we took off and I said to old Chaz, okay, you take off down the Mazunga River, you keep going, you'll see one river coming in from the right, leave that, keep going, keep going, you see a second river, there it is now, turn right on that river, up ahead of us there's a little copy, you better pull up now because we're going to come under fire and right then we came under fire. Sure. And like hail from the ground up 
and uh, the chopper was hit many times. I just saw the floor between my legs opening up like tin, like chocolate paper, you know, that tin foil paper just opening up and these green hornets just whizzing all over the place. Felt a punch in the arm. I was hit in the arm by some shrapnel and Chaz said to me, uh, Major, you okay? I've been hit in the face with some shrapnel, but I'm okay. I said, I'm fine. All gave him a thumbs up. And right then Beaver said, uh, I've got visual KCAR firing and he started firing. So the punch up uh, went on and the KCAR engaged many targets on the ground. We could see all these it was very exciting and incoming fire. They fired RPG-7 at us, big circle on the ground as normal. Uh, the guys warning us, watch out, you got incoming rockets and so on and so on. Deploying the stops. For me, everything goes into slow motion. And uh, I would then try and speak uh, very slowly, uh, like I'd picked up from the pilots, how they used to speak, because it would give the guys confidence on the ground. I'd use the guys' nicknames or first names. Hey Theo, stop one, move the air. Brian, stop three, move here, Andy, stop two, whatever, you know, and uh, to try and keep everybody calm and so on. And the fire force action raged, and uh, in the meantime, we put in a few strikes with the links. We put in some strikes with the links. Um, we were on target, and the whole thing was going extremely well. We were running out of light at this time, and I said to the lads on the ground, okay, guys, you're gonna, the last laugh is on me. Uh, Chaz and I have been wounded slightly, nothing to write home about, but uh, obviously uh, good for drinks later on. I got a bit of shrapnel in the arm and Chaz has got some shrapnel in the face. I'm going to leave you tonight in ambush positions and I want you, stop one and two, to combine together and I then gave them the details for the evening. There was a bit of whinging, oh man, you know, they were all uh, so excited. Uh, we had at this time killed 16 um, and uh, I believe the others were in the area. We put in an ambush position that night with stops one and two over the dead bodies and before this Lionel Reynolds who was our int man had briefed us that they were using cowbells and they were ringing cowbells when they came into a village to stop the dogs barking and also to alert other members in the area and whatever. Is that where you got whacked in the arm, John? Yeah, I'm afraid so. That's my big <laughs> bullet wound. <laughs> As a result of this, uh, we had bought some kettlebells from the locals in Bitebridge and we'd given them to each stop. And I thought this is a good chance maybe for us to check out these cowbells. Anyway, like one o'clock in the morning, 0100 hours, I got woken by the camp signaler. He said to me, so you better come in. Uh, these guys had just had a contact in the in the contact area and I went and spoke to them and what had happened was they'd heard these guys coming back and they were calling comrade comrade and uh, our men just my guys on the ground stopped one and two kept quiet and when they got a bit closer they then they could hear this bell tingling they were using the bell the cow bell and they pulled out their bell and thought big eyes oh, oh, and they tinkled their little bell and the, the two groups got closer and closer together. It was pitch black at that time. When they were about seven paces away, uh, the call sign opened up on, the, on this little group of that had come back in. They released an RPG-7 that one of them was carrying and fortunately it went over the top of their heads because they were all lying down. Uh, they culled uh, two and, uh, and subsequently one guy got away. We, I'd put a long stop out the night before, before we, uh, when I came back in, and we caught that guy the next morning. Anyway, the, the end result of the whole thing, and from the premonition that I was telling you about how we started off, 20 gooks, uh, we had 16 kills on the ground. I forgot to mention we had one capture at that time as well. So it was 16 plus one capture, 17. Then that night we had two kills, and the next uh, evening in a stop group, 2RR was manning for us, we got the third guy. So we got all 20 in the matter of two days. And uh, that just, to me, highlighted this thing that when you have a sixth sense and so on, you should follow it, especially during a wartime. We would do back in our role as Fire Force Delta at Bite Bridge, when Andre Dennison uh, was sent down to me with his uh, paradeck and uh, 16 guys that he was going to loan to me as, para, as the para stops. 
these guys were based up at the airfield. We had a big call out. We went on a, uh, this huge punch up and uh, a couple of things happened right in the beginning. Uh, that area, Bite Bridge, being low altitude or uh, only 300 and something meters above sea level, aircraft have this problem. At that low altitude, 300 meters above sea level, aircraft uh, suffer from a problem called density altitude. We were very heavy with a full bin of ammunition, 20 mil ammo, and a full tank of fuel when we tried to take off from the camp. Uh, the pilot pulled the collective. We got airborne we were about i don't know 20 feet off the ground the weight was too much within the heat and the density altitude and we just creamed in and the chopper blades came down and whacked the ground and chopped the, the boom tail tail boom off and we bounced around like a chicken with our head cut off uh, the pilot telling us all to sit tight myself and the and the gunner and eventually the chopper came to a, a standstill and the engine sort of stopped and we were about six feet from this big fuel tanker that we had there. So we were very lucky. I had to then run with rubber legs to uh, a G car that I was going to use as the K car to command the fire force in. And that's how we went into it. Anyway, back into this big punch up that we had there. Uh, the first thing that happened on the ground was quite humorous. It turned out to be quite humorous. We just started the punch up and the uh, there was a blue smoke on the ground, which I think was indicating that somebody was either hit or injured or whatever. And I came on the mean straight away and said, what's the problem? And they said, uh, Bjorn has got a problem. Uh, he's got diarrhea and vomiting. Uh, obviously you can't be involved in a contact if you, if you have these problems. So we had to send in a G car to pick this guy up and we placed him on top of one of these big uh, gomos there, a big granite outcrop right on the top of it and got back into the punch up. We had a run around with one who had an RPD. He was uh, was hiding behind this baobab tree and he kept running around around the baobab tree, sticking close to it and we couldn't get a shot at him. And eventually we did a, a dummy sort of fake to the left and then came back around the right and were able to nail him with a 20 mil cannon. So there was a bit of humor as well. Um, but then I dropped the, the we called, brought in the paradeck with uh, the 16 RER guys. They hit the ground, I threw them out together. I didn't like to keep guys in the air uh, in a punch up because I was feeling for them on how they get air sick and so on. And uh, they hit the ground and I used them as a sweep line. And I must tell you here, yeah, this is something that was amazing. The 16 guys from the RER 14 of them had MAGs and only two, the st uh, stick leader in the middle and the one medic had uh, had rifles. So we had this wave of 14 MAGs spewing out 1200 rounds per minute as our sweep line moving through the area. It was amazing and uh, very, very effective. And we had a great punch up and at the end of the punch up, so we'd had this great punch up, it was starting to get dark and we were wrapping things up. Guys were bringing the bodies into a central position and so on. We were gonna do the mopping up. I left a few call signs on the ground and uh, in ambush and we were uh, just saying our farewells and we were just heading out when i heard this little voice on the radio uh, sunray you've left me on top of the gomo <laughs> <laughs> and we had to do an about turn and go back there and switch on the aircraft light and i'd left old brian Bean on top of this bloody copy uh, much to everybody's uh, amusement and of course it cost me a lot of beers and in history later whenever we're together old Brian Bian will always say aye sir remember when you left me on top of the hill and I had to buy him round so yeah but a very good punch up and it was interesting with that RER call sign.